the RPG Maker General Podcast, or the RPG MGP. What? You were expecting a cute girl? Sorry to disappoint you. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to another installment of the RPG Maker General Podcast, or the RPG MGP, your one-stop shop for everything RPG Maker. This is Marfix, a.k.a. Cody, and with me today, we have Blue Sky Robin. I'm Blue Sky Robin. Hello. As well as our pal... uh, Currently slaving away on Star Ruler 2, Fergoff. Hello. Hola. Uh, so not a whole lot in the news this week, from what I can tell. Uh, Yanfly has a couple new plugins, including uh, Area of Effect, because for some reason, in RPG Maker MV, there are only two settings for skills and spells. You can attack one enemy, or you can attack all of them. And with this new Area of Effect plugin, you can now target rows and columns... A similar to Mega Man Battle Network, you can do a radius like with Golden Sun. So he actually turned it into what would almost be a tactical battle system without having to do all the complicated grid movement. I, I would see. love if Kadokawa would officially endorse that plugin. Oh heck yeah! I've been look, <laughs> I've been looking for like a rose and thing. I uh, I didn't notice his work on it. I'll check it out later. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It is Katakawa that's doing MV, right? Not uh, Dekika Games? You see, you're just speaking Greek to me right now. I don't know who's making the RPG makers for PC. <laughs> Katakawa's involved, but I don't remember who else. Mm-hmm. Uh, as sorry, for... I didn't to continue. Uh, as for the news, um, is that all from Yanfly? Because there's a... Uh... There's a new RPG game, well, technically new, sort of old, actually. The Okage the Shadow King for PS4 launches, uh, I think it's already launched, actually. It used to be a PS2 game. It's really stylish, really nice-looking RPG. Uh, I want to try this out. Is it just a HD mix of it, or...? Oh, actually, it's not... Uh, actually, it's some sort of... Uh, from what I can read, it's an emulation, upscale PS2 oh. emulation, which is kind of sad, but like, it's it's a classic game, and it's it was on the early, early PS2. It's like, I'll, I'll show a link oh, or man. something late in a bit. The art's nice. The art's really nice. And even even if it's not a true remake or whatever, I think it's worth playing for those who haven't yet. I haven't yet, so that's why I want to try it. Yeah, I'm glad that a lot of older games like that are getting brought up because it seems like there are some games that we've done right but we haven't actually repeated, like, for example, the Dark Cloud series that was also on early PS2. Yep. It seems like uh, in that era between, uh, what would that be, 6th gen would be PS2? Mm, I forgot the generation labels where we're at now. Okay, well, between, in the 32-bit, 64-bit era, with between the PlayStation 1 and PlayStation 2, there was a lot of creativity coming out of the market. And it wasn't just Square Enix, you know, popping out 80 different kinds of RPGs. It was also stuff like Okage and stuff like Odin Sphere, which I believe was also on PS2. It's That's also getting a remake soon, I think, mm-hmm. for the PS3, PS4... Uh, with, like, new stuff happening for it. Damn it. I really wish that they would release the goddamn HD collection for Ace Combat. <laughs> I really do. Ace Combat. Every uh, year I wait for it. Every year it doesn't happen. <laughs> I, I I don't even remember that. Uh, uh. Ace Combat is planes. You're flying, you're flying jets, and you're shooting down other jets. And the soundtrack, ah, right. the soundtrack is always nothing short of amazing. Ah, right. Yeah, like since I couldn't. Go ahead. Since it's planes, you, rem- you remind me that no wonder I haven't heard of it. It's because I crash all the time when I play plane games. <laughs> <laughs> Oh man, don't even get me get me started. So Adam is a big fan of Ace Combat and also of uh, War Thunder, and I cannot into War Thunder at all. It, the The game is fairly simple in its preface. You fly a plane, you shoot down other planes, but they all have their little different controls and 
Yeah. Yep. And and I'm very good at video games, but I think that one in particular, I have the the stars have aligned and said I cannot be good at War Thunder at all. It just cannot happen. <laughs> I mean, like, <laughs> well, yeah. I mean, sounds I, like I, you I just can kind of. I, I can get. Uh, I can kind of get into the basic controls and stuff, but like being shot is like nah. <laughs> Yeah. No. Like I, I, I also have a, I also have a friend that's really into War Thunder. I've watched him play it, and I've, I was like, okay, that's, that's a good plane. You, you die in one hit. Like, no, no, this is a tanky plane. And then I see him again. Like, oh, is that your tanky plane? No, that's the, that's the one that dies really fast, or but has bombs and stuff. And I'm like, <laughs> I can't tell the difference between these things. Like, what? <laughs> yeah. Uh, so yeah. Especially, plane. go ahead. <laughs> Playing games like that's just not for me. It's like I can do the the simulation ones where it's just me and nothing else, but but with the bullets and the bombs and nah, I can't handle that. Yeah, War Thunder for me is like playing Mario Party because no ma- you don't know where you're gonna hit the other guy, and you could hit him in some useless part of their wing, and they're gonna still fly, or you shoot him right in the pilot, and there, hey, they're dead instantly, or you hit him. Right at where the wing joint connects with the body. Hey, there goes the wing. Hey, GG. And that you know that one bullet is either it's either it does nothing or it does everything. And and that's why I call it Mario Party with planes. <laughs> hey, it's oh, possible man. to fly without a wing. <laughs> no, the game will tell you your wing got cut off by Jackass 420. Oh. And then he flies away in his Yak 9 or his P51 or. But it would be so demoralizing to be shot down by the three machine guns on the right wing of a plane. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. man. Some of them have I'm like... sure you can fly without wings for, like, two seconds. <laughs> oh, no, you can, you can keep it stable. It's just, from that point forward, you will forego any notion of turning. Yeah. <laughs> Especially with uh, with the mouse movement, because basically you just you move your mouse, and then the plane does its damnedest to move to that point. So if you're using mouse oh, movement God. like a casual, like I am, yes, and yes, don't don't do that. <laughs> yeah, and your wing gets clipped. Well, you have to like hold up left or up right, and and totally ruin your vision in order to fly straight. At the very least, use a controller. <laughs> <laughs> like an analog stick is so much better because you you get much more. Of a constant, it's all about constants in planes, you know. Yeah, it, I, I lose either way because my controller it has a very large dead zone, so I oh. either have max response or minimum minimum response. That's sad. Yeah, it's it's all right for Rocket League, but not that. And the other thing is with with War Thunder, they have forced mouse acceleration. So unlike, uh, I really like TF2 and Left 4 Dead and those Source games because where your mouse is is how your mouse reacts. You move it here, you know it's going to be here. With, with mouse acceleration, you're always like, this little tiny movement does nothing, this large movement wasn't enough, and then I just jerk the mouse across the desk, and oh, look, I finally moved, and it's way too much. <laughs> What's uh, up with your that's, peripherals, that, man? <laughs> no, no, this mouse is perfect for TF2. I can, I can hit people as like a scout, all right? I'm a decent scout at TF2, but you put me in Payday or War Thunder where they arbitrarily slow down the mouse if it doesn't, if you don't move it five inches or more. Oh, that, that grinds my gears. That, are that you, doesn't are sound sure like acceleration didn't... at all. That's like mouse deceleration. <laughs> It's you get something. negative values. It Bad really mouse, retracts my flaps, put. let me tell you. <laughs> Bad inputs. Did, did you buy your stuff from, like, a shady guy outside of a Walmart for $5 each? <laughs> no, no, I, I am the happy owner of both a Logitech controller and a Logitech mouse. Mm, well, Logitech could be good or bad. No, um, like I was saying... The source games don't mess with your mouse at all. The movement is pure. With with Payday and War Thunder, they assume you have a controller or something, and they just, they arbitrarily make the mouse movements untrue to my intent. Oh man, I hate 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 that game. But that's not RPG Maker. Uh, <laughs> so what what are you guys working on? How's your progress coming? Slow. Oh. Well, I mean, you're working on the collab. 
Oh man, I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna like surpass you eventually, and it's <laughs> bothering me way too much. <laughs> uh, I'm hoping it doesn't yet. It's getting there. <laughs> I've just been. I put thirty bucks out into the community to get some scripts for uh, my game done. Um, they're coming back now, and I think some of the stuff that I did in the main JavaScript files or the thing that I did in my custom script uh, for the little HUD overlay um, is screwing them up, so I have to get those fixed. Mm. Um, presently, the I by trying to fix it, I destroyed the HUD overlay system. Um, so now i got to figure out how to tell it to create the bitmaps for everything, but don't put anything into them unless uh, a switch is on. Um, but do put things into them whenever I change map if that switch is on. It's proving to be difficult to get it to do that. Ah. Nasty. There is one more thing. Um, oh, shit. I guess well, this is a... it was invisible. Oh. Damn it, I just had an epiphany. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right. Well, there is one more thing with me. Um, a friend of mine who I guess wants to remain anonymous uh, started making a game in February and just recently gave me a test game of it. It's, uh, I don't think I'm allowed to say the title, but it looks okay. It's, it kind of plays like The Witch's House or games like that. You know what it is. Kind of creepy and, like, I guess the theme of this one is, like, uh, sketches and drawings or something. Because, like, cause like uh, there's uh, paper monsters and whatnot. Hmm. I don't know. Hmm. Ah, so do the... The paintings attack you then? Not all of them. Like some, like okay. There's like the the clean papers, and then there's the blacked out. Uh, the dirty blotched, papers. <laughs> blotched papers, and you're not. You don't want to be touching the blotched out dirty ones. And then there's like sketch sketch people that come to life or something. And then I know like. The pure black ones you have to avoid, and there's one specific one that's a uh, creepy shouting woman, I guess, and you have to avoid her too. Mm. But like, it's it's like, yeah, I don't, I don't, I haven't finished it. Um, she's uh, the, the my friend said it's like two hours tops, I guess. Ooh, that takes a while. Damn. Well, well, it's mostly like puzzles and weird stuff. Even so, I mean, I was only able to get dim to what forty minutes, maybe, depending. Oh uh, well, That's a majority of it is like. <laughs> I think they still used uh, a lot of the RTP assets, so that's why uh. it's been done so quick. That makes sense. Yeah, is that their first game? It might be because it was an MV. I'm not sure if they just uh, transferred assets over or what, but like, there are some. There are like some of their hand-drawn assets. I can tell how they draw, but like a lot of the tiles, I uh, just really looks like RTP at the start. All right. Well, congratulations uh, for putting a game out. Yeah. Whoever they are. Yeah. Uh... Fields. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, anonymous person. Uh, All right. Yeah. So uh, over on my end, uh, just I, I had a I had about an hour free uh, during my busy weekend, and so I put a little more time to feed the darkness. And I really hated how uh, I make this nice big text box thing. Okay. So I had a, a message box. It had some stuff getting sent in it, and then <clears throat> I wanted to add more stuff, and then I said I didn't need that stuff, and then instead of updating the data, I hit cancel, and there went the entire message box. <laughs> yeah. Oh! You were that guy who posted that. Oh, oh okay. I, I wasn't that guy, but I totally empathize with him. Oh, okay. <laughs> I've done that a couple times, and it kills me every time. <laughs> oh, man. I want to slap myself that's, when it happens. <laughs> that's why, that's why whenever I that's why whenever I tab out of like RPG Maker and then go back in, I'm like, you know what? I'll just save this right now, just in case, 
because if it's if if there's a mistake, like I'll I can go back and fix that. If I actually progress and didn't save it, I'm like, oh, that's 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 worse for me. So like, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I should be uh, playing RPG Maker like I play Deus Ex. Just hit hit save every five seconds. Doesn't matter what's happening. <laughs> yeah. Oh, am I gonna get caught? Save whatever. <laughs> yeah. Aside from that, uh, I also finally installed uh, RPG Maker XP and VX Ace because I bought them in a humble bundle back in 2014. Same. Uh, yeah. So I just finally gave them a shot, and I. I like square sprites when it's Game Boy style and and the resolution is small because it leaves stuff open to your imagination. But with with how uh, complex the sprites in VXAs are, I don't like square. I like XP's rectangle people better. Yeah, I can kind of see that. Yeah, I think it's a it's a fair complaint. Yeah, and so then the question becomes: Do I make custom assets? And and movement and hitboxes and stuff for Ace, or do I just make my next tiny project in XP? Man. That's that's actually why I like I was trying to do tile sets, and then I just decided, you know, I'll just make these sixteen by sixteen. They are still kind of like a bitch to make. <laughs> Let me tell you that for free. And oh, jeez. But like, if you. If, if if it's too high res and then you make it square, it's too squished and doesn't look right. Or, like yeah, and the funny thing is, like the map, the map uh, tiles have doors that are like too tall at least. <laughs> in XP or Ace, I think in Ace there's all, there's as well, but it might be possible in v in VX. I mean in in. Whatever XP, whatever. <laughs> I don't know what I'm talking about anymore. But I I know in Ace there's doors that are too high. Uh, like even there, like you can even animate them or stuff. Yeah, I I think that uh, that the PS1 version and XP got it right with the people being a square and a half tall. It gives them what I think are proper proportions. And that's what those doors are for, because a door looks really stupid when it's square, but if your characters are one square high, then that's all that's as tall as the door needs to be. Yeah. One and a half's a good size. Like yeah. that's the that's the Final Fantasy size, right? From uh six onwards. I think it's four in US or something. Or three, I don't three. know. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know which one you guys consider that as. Yeah, it, it's three. Uh, what? Yeah, because if I remember correctly, I know for a fact that Final Fantasy One had a square overworld sprite, and then the battle sprites were rectangular. One and a half. Yeah, yeah, they were one and a half. And then yeah, FF Six, they just used the battle sprites as the overworld sprites. You want to weigh in, Fergoth? Mm -hmm. About sprites. Yeah. Well, I mean, I'm for whatever does the job, really. But what's your what's your preferred style? All your people, all your doors. Do you want them? Do you want them square? Do you want them head and a half like XP? Do you want them two by one like Suikoden? What's your what's your poison? Hmm. Well, uh, you're asking that question, which will have a number of answers depending on what part of me. You're asking. Uh, <laughs> the artist in me loves the square because it's goddamn easy. Uh, <laughs> I, don't have to, I don't have to give a shit about things overlapping because nothing overlaps in square. Hmm. Um, if you do head and a half, it looks more realistic, which satisfies my more aesthetically pleasing side. Um, but of course it takes longer and I have to do parallax mapping often because it'll be a little bit off or it won't be working right in the tile set. Envy. Um... <laughs> And, yeah, so, I mean, it, it depends. <laughs> All right. Yeah, I, I would, I like Square only for low resolution, as in, like, Game Boy games, like Pokemon or, or Final Fantasy Legend, because you aren't, you only have so much screen real estate, and you want to put as much of the map on there as possible. I think it works well from top down. Squares? Yep. Ah. 
if it's strictly top down, yeah, I can see it. But like, for because like a lot of the a lot of the RPG games are like slightly angled from the top down. Yep. So, so it doesn't usually work out like that. No, we do a lot of forced perspective. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Speaking of forced perspective, I I really do kind of like the look of uh, uh, what was it called, Lisa the whatever. <laughs> yeah. Like the sideways thing. Yeah. That's yeah. It's it's a neat it's a neat thing to bypass the the squareness while still looking good. If I, if I ever did something in MV, I, I know that it's 48 by 48. I think I would just take the square and then shave off the sides. I wouldn't use probably the left 8 pixels and the right 8 pixels, so I would actually have my proper perspective with a good resolution. Mm-hmm. Yeah. The, only, the only reason I'm mentioning the side view thing is because I, I had an idea for a game but the only way it looked good is if it was sideways, because uh, because the the aesthetic, well, the aesthetic for it would be like uh, silhouettes, and a lot of it will look like iPad commercials. So yeah. <laughs> okay. It wouldn't work in any other kind of like style other than sideways. So yeah, I'm just saying. That was my one idea one time. Yeah, top-down silhouettes would look pretty silly. Especially mm-hmm. true top-down, like a Grand Theft Auto 2, you just got like a torso and arms and some feet. <laughs> oh, man. That'd be those, weird. those were the days back then, huh? Mm-hmm. Screaming around in my uh, armored bank car, uh, singing along to Taxi Drivers Must Die. It's great. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. So is that it for the news? Or is there a bit more? Uh, I I think that's everything. Slow All right, then. All right. And uh, so, my advice for this week, back your shit up. Are we going to podcast, like, right now? Hello? As opposed to another time? <laughs> we do it other times, most of the time. This is the only time we've done it right now, actually. <laughs> so precedent dictates, generally speaking, we'll do it not right now. <laughs> <laughs> It doesn't sound like an us problem. It sounds like a you problem. <laughs> hey, how about I kill you, and then you'll have a you problem, you fucking twat. I will fucking know you. How's that sound? <laughs> fucking jokes? You're going to is... make jokes? How about I make jokes about committing acts of murder, you piece of shit? <laughs> You're free to? Thank you. Thank you for giving me permission to do that, you utter bastard. <laughs> okay, Windsor, this is a Nintendo podcast. We was fine without you. Ha! Yeah, thanks for the Wii. I'm gonna, I'm gonna go off that lead in. I'm gonna talk about the Wii. I, I hate it. Every great game on the Wii, every game that would otherwise be 10 out of 10, to me, is can only reach 8 out of 10 just based on the control scheme. Like The best example I can think of is Donkey Kong Country Returns. I love everything about that game. I think, mechanically, I think it is better than any Donkey Kong um, Country game prior to that. Um, But I don't... The fact that you have to shake the Wii Remote to roll is just unforgivable to me. It is... I can't can't look past that. It ruins the game completely. And there's levels based on, like, precision of rolling. You have to do a roll and then a jump and then another roll as soon as you land because there's, like, a time limit. And that's really cool to me. I love the fact that there's, like, levels in a Nintendo game that came out in the last, like, five years that are based on technical skill because that's so rare for Nintendo. (laughs) But it's impossible to precisely roll when your rolls are based on doing a silly thing with the fucking controller. And that's why I don't like the Wii. Thank you and for that's the podcast. Yeah. Thanks yeah, for joining go. us. Goodbye. <laughs> hey, hey, Windsor, you are just in time to talk about our main subject. Would you like to join us? Yeah, go. Run. What are you talking about? Right. Run. What for golf? Telling them to run. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> or it still has a choice. <laughs> <laughs> no, you can no longer escape. You have booted up the game. And we are talking about, uh, basically story structure. You know, how to make a good opening to an RPG. And... I think that the 16-bit era got it right where you throw 10 to 15 lines of text at, it, at someone, you flash a couple screens, and then before the two-minute mark, bam, you have control of the character. A anyone disagree? 16-bit era, the best era. Uh, yeah. N64 Man. era is the okay. best. 1997 specifically is the best year in video game history. I can't disagree with that. 97. Good year. In fact, 97, 97, 98, and 99 were all pretty damn good years, really. Because, mm -hmm. to me, the 3D gaming was like starting from the beginning all over again with video games. So people were trying things that they'd never tried before. There were a lot of completely original ideas. But at the same time, they developed ideas from producing 2D games, which they could use in the production of their games and then build off. And there was also the fact that they were able to do things that they maybe wanted to do and planned to do for a long time that they hadn't been able to do previously. And that's how you get games like um, Legends of the Rock Arena of Time and Metal Gear Solid 1. Um, and I think, not Banjo-Kazooie, but there was another one. There was another really good game that came out in 97. Uh, I don't know if this was 97, but I like to hold up uh, Castlevania Symphony of the Night as a really, really good example of that era because... They made a Castlevania game and went, now what if we could use every inch of disk space on this CD? And there are so many enemies, there are very few reskins, they have a whole second castle for you to go through. They just, they made a gigantic game because they had the space to do it. Big fat fucking game. Yeah. <clears throat> I think your introduction should fit your gameplay and your, uh, your general approach to it, like... Super Mario 64 had a great introduction, and Metal Gear Solid 1 have a great introduction, and the way they handled their introduction, introductions is completely different. <laughs> uh, Super Mario 64 starts with a letter, and then you pop out of a tube, and then you're playing. <laughs> yep. Uh, <laughs> Metal Gear Solid 1 has this whole introduction sequence and backstory, and then you arrive and do a short sneaking portion, and then you get another introduction sequence, and then you're playing. Okay, um, those two that you mentioned, I would, I would like borderline them as kind of bad for yeah. introductions. Really now? I, I don't think Super Mario really needs much of an intro introduction in the first place, really. Unless yes, you're I doing mean, something really well, weird with it. It's not a game about plot, it's a game about jumping. I mean, <laughs> just wanna jump. like, <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, that's, that's true. For for Mario, but like I when I when I remember sixty four, I remember the whole lot of tutorials because back then Nintendo didn't trust you to know anything about anything because like because like that was new territory at the time. So Super Mario sixty four had a lot of tutorials front loaded into the into the start. That's funny because the only tutorial I specifically remember is you jump out of the pipe. And then Lakitu tells you all about, hey, it's a 3D game, and this is how you control the camera, and then you then you gain control of Mario, and you're off to the races. I don't even think they tell you that the B button punches stuff. No, I don't think they do. Uh, well, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Back, like, back then, the camera thing was a big deal, because no one knew how to do cameras back then. Mm -mm. But but then, like, you mentioned you mentioned Metal Gear Solid, and it's... it's uh, Metal Gear Solid, right? It's the yeah. intro is a bit too long. Like, eh. like for me, for me, I don't know about you guys, but for me, it's a bit too long. Like, assuming I didn't know anything because I started with that, and like, oh no, there's this guy, and he wants the big boss, and the the, the this and that, and the, and you're you're riding a a torpedo in through the water, and like, <laughs> like all these credits while we're talking and stuff. I mean, it's okay, I guess, but, like, if it came in without knowing anything, it's like, is, is this a movie, or, like, it's it's weird. It's a little too long. I, I think what Fergoff was saying is that the introductions to the game match the intent of the game. So, Mario, 
you know, you get you get the letter, you get the camera controls, and then you're off to the races. It's an action uh-huh. game, you know. It sets up the expectation of this is a game about running and jumping and having fun. And, you know, it just sends you off to do that and go play. Whereas Metal Gear Solid, it's kind of about the stealth gameplay, but it's more about Hideo Kojima's convoluted plot and the intrigue. And if you're intrigued by the introduction, if you want to know more then you will get plenty more and then some as you continue playing the game. Ah, uh, yeah. Well, back in the first game, the Metal Gear Solid wasn't convoluted as much. Uh. It just got worse over time, but yeah, I see your point. Yeah. See, I can't really I can't really speak on like technical analysis cuz I'm just not that kind of guy, but I love the MGS1 intro cuz it's so cool. Like <laughs> It was de- it was I I had I had watched Escape from LA <laughs> just like two weeks before I started playing it. And I was like, damn, this is Escape from LA the video game. Of course it wasn't, but <laughs> But like the dialogue is so good for that time period because it sounds like something you'd hear in a film and that that was never in video games before. Like yeah. The, the 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 characters sound like humans, and there's so many like memorable lines. And the fact that Edgar Allan Hoover was a notorious racist is a plot point in the game. Like that, that's the best, man. <laughs> that's that's as good as it gets, dude. All right, all right, all right. I guess I guess you got a point. But like, I guess when I was young and wasn't so into politics and etc., it just went over my head. I guess. Yeah, and, and that's fine too, because you know at the time Metal Gear Solid wasn't your kind of game. You wanted a you wanted a more actiony game, but now that you're older and matured, and you you want something more meaningful. You want something with some bite to it, you know. Yeah, uh, with it, stupid robot fights. <laughs> yeah, in that regard, I think that's why Skyrim really drops the ball on its introduction compared to Morrowind because. You know, it's a Bethesda oh, game. Man. It's it's supposed to be open world. You're supposed to, you're supposed to go on a journey and find stuff out for yourself. You're supposed and the to... first thing that happens is like your guy, whoever your guy is, is a prisoner on a cart, and all your all the prisoner guys are talking to each other about pro about like proper nouns and names you don't know, and then and then you don't see anything because you're all in a forest, and then. You you have to wait until everyone's at the execution site, and then there's a dragon, and then after a long like tutorial section, then you can see oh the world is actually open. <laughs> but until then, yeah. until then you're tied up at the prison cart. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and it's all very cinematic. That would be a good way to have a movie script, but with the Elder Scrolls games, you're supposed to make your own fun. You're supposed to discover things. You want it to feel special when you find something. And that's why in Morrowind, you wake up on a boat, you get off the boat, you sign a few forms, and you're off to the races. And then everything from that point is you. You discover things. You get lost in the woods and get killed by mud crabs after half an hour. You know? (laughs) I I still remember that story from you. Oh, boy. Yeah, I think a better... A better introduction to Skyrim would be like you crossing the border into Skyrim. Yeah. Hmm. I mean, I, mean, I don't know how you introduce dragons person. into that equation, <laughs> and that's probably why that happened. But no, oh, no, just... I can already, I, I can already think of a infinitely better intro. You like, you go <laughs> cross the bridge or whatever, go to the border checkpoint, go sign these papers. Okay, sign all these papers. There's your character creation. Oh no, it's a dragon. I don't think that it'd be signing papers. I'm pretty sure it'd be illegally get into Skyrim is your first. Oh, is that? Is that? Oh, all right. <laughs> well, that wasn't the first thing I thought of, but all right. Okay, I'm gonna. Well, whatever the case. I'm gonna write a Skyrim intro like where there's a troll and you have to you have to pay the troll toll to get into <laughs> Skyrim. You have to pay the troll toll to get in. Of course, he's not actually. He's not an actual state representative. No, no, he's not. You just he, he confound your lousy troll soul. That's what you say to him because you don't want to pay the troll souls just, to get in. It's just a wall of dragons interrupted by one troll. <laughs> <laughs> we are we are on we are on the be- 
best of roles right here. Mm -hmm. You pay the troll oh. toll, or you take the dragon path. <laughs> I never like those Skyrim games because, like, I feel like everything just everything just feels the same. Like in Zelda. You get the slingshot and it's a game changer. It's a different game, and then you get the hook shot and the game is a different game again. And then you turn it into a wolf, and once again you're playing a completely different game. But like in Skyrim, you always just press the A button to interact with things, and you talk to guys and you fight them, and sometimes you pick locks. And like for like a hundred hours, you're just doing the same thing over and over. It's it's the same reason I don't like procedurally generated levels. Like I always feel like you know. It, I, original content, like something brand new, is always much better to me. Uh, yeah. It depends but on how you get to do the Fusrodas! <laughs> yeah, man, uh. this is pressing a button, man. It doesn't, it doesn't <laughs> mean anything. I don't think that we're at the point where we can do complete procedural generation and pull off, you know, the feel of the living world. But I definitely think that you can build, like, set pieces that can be interconnected and leave that up to uh, leave the connecting of them and placing of them up to an algorithm. Yeah. What I was going to bring up about uh, Zelda versus Elder Scrolls is that Elder Scrolls has a lot more lore than Zelda does. With Zelda, the world is... It, it, you're not supposed to give two shits about where any of it came from. Like, here's Hyrule Field. Here's the castle. Why isn't the castle centrally located in the field? Because fuck you, that's why. Uh, Why would they, the castle be in a field anyway? Well, they was, felt very confident about their military <laughs> skills. <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah. man, yeah, because you're just told that that this is how the world is, and that makes sense. Oh, and a ranch that's completely undefended and in the middle of the world and could be attacked by any side—it's still there. Why? Probably because they're the only the world's the world's only supplier of milk. We don't know. It doesn't matter because fuck you. Uh, but. You know, the world is just, it's simply there, and you uh, you gain gameplay from it, you know, by unlocking the hookshot and these other things. But with Elder Scrolls, everything is done more cerebrally and with more intent. And you have all these races, and you have a bunch of books that you can read about how they interact, you can see how towns were founded and why. You know, there's a lot more minutia that comes with it. And if you enjoy reading about histories of fake places, you can do that in the Elder Scrolls games. and You can talk to people and learn their backstories, but in Zelda, you're not encouraged to find out the history of a place. You're just expected to enjoy it for what it is. Yep. Mm. Where did Octoroks come from? Who cares? Kill it. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, but, I mean, a good introduction, I feel like is one that just keeps my attention and you can do that a number of ways um but it's it's absolutely critical that you give the player something to do whether it's be intrigued by something in which case you better be really good at getting people intrigued like that yeah. or um just doing media and res which is what a lot of people do um media and res yes can starting the action off with action know? already going off ah okay yeah, so like Final Fantasy VII, how they do that cutscene, they introduce you to the world of Midgar, and then bam, you hop off a train, and it's on like Donkey Kong. That's great. That is a great intro. Yeah, now that yeah. that manages on a couple of levels to be a successful introduction. Yeah. You know, game. You know, game has a really awful introduction. Homestuck has a really. <laughs> it's it's really that... bad. Like, I think the point of the Homestuck intro is that you're supposed to kind of you're supposed to kind of get to know this character and start to like him before anything happens but there is like a hundred pages of nothing happening and for a long time like right at the start of Homestuck's big popularity boom before people decided they didn't want to like Homestuck because the fan base was awful which it undeniably is <laughs> um, there were two kinds of people there were people who loved Homestuck because they'd managed to get past the first hundred boring pages, <laughs> and there were people who tried reading Homestuck and given up because the first hundred-ish pages were so boring and awful. Mm -hmm. And, like, I think that is a perfect example. Because Homestuck would have... It has a lot of fans. I don't think any of us can deny that. But it would have more fans if it wasn't for the, I would say, like, 25% of people who try reading Homestuck and give up 
at the intro because that might be the worst introduction in a piece of fiction of all time. And like, I'm not exaggerating. Just in terms of the sheer volume of people who are turned off by that intro, it might... Because whatever you're going for, if your introduction is turning away people in that volume, it's bad. It is bad. It just like... Okay. Like Final Fantasy thirteen, okay, yeah, but if you just get through the first thousand pages, no, I'm not going to sit there for, you know, 5, 10, 20 hours and pray that it gets better. I have better things to do. Yeah, yeah. Oh, man, FF13. As, as after you get through your 50th hallway, I'm sure the game opens up and everything, but, like, come on. Yeah, no, I could, I could have played five Call of Duty games with ten hallways apiece. And enjoy each and every one of them before I started getting any sort of flavor out of FF13. I played FF13, um, and I can only say that the world actually opens up 13 hours in. Um, wow. Wow, that's a good so. number right there. I don't want to waste 13 hours of my free time being bored when I spend them playing Street Fight Surf. Uh, and then it opens up uh, too much. <laughs> <laughs> oh boy! All right, let me let me just like give a couple of examples for like my criteria of good intro and bad intro. A good intro would be like uh, Persona Three. Like what happens is like you got the main character riding a train. He's going to a new town, and then he gets off the train. Like the clock strikes midnight, and then weird creepy stuff happens, ooh, and, like, yeah, and in Persona 4, it got ass backwards as hell, because, like, because, <laughs> like, okay, let's assume you didn't read the back of the box, or let's assume you have no idea what this game is about, like, you just popped the disc in and whatever, and, uh, like, like, okay, you start off, you, sure, you get off the train, and then you meet your uncle and your niece, and then... You go to a gas station, all right, and then you go around to your uncle's house because that's where you're going to be staying, and you go to the school, you introduce to everyone, and then you meet a couple of friends, and then this goes on and on for like about four hours before <laughs> anything nice happens. <laughs> I mean, there's like iffy weirdness, like... Like the gas attendant shaking your hand, like, can I shake your hand? <laughs> but like, but like, that's the only weird thing that happens at the start. It's not like, it's not like, it's not like in Persona 3 where the clock strikes midnight and then people turned into coffins and like weird shit happens. You know? It's not like that at all. It's like four hours of Tomodachi life. And before. Whoa. Before even, like, the first dungeon or the first sign of murder or something. Yeah, I mean, the, the difference between 3 and 4 is they're both using the same, you know, the, the hero cycle. Um, they're both using the same, some weird shit happens, which is the genesis for our story starting. Um, the, yes. Whatever that's called, the, the descent into a new or strange world. Um, like, 3 is like, and... Shit's real, um, and four is very subtle about it. Where it's it's you kind of just walk past it and it just whispers in your. By the way, shit's real, and you totally miss it. <laughs> that's, that's that's like oh uh, man, Persona Four is a great game though. Like the gameplay, excellent. The story, superb. That intro is horrible though. <laughs> I, I I get that they're trying mean, to be subtle because they wanted it to be more like a crime investigation game, and so they they wanted it to be a little bit more you know like who's who what's the who's who's dangling all these puppets, but I mean it, it just it gets I think it, they were they played it too safe, too too like, safe. Yeah, I guess. I mean, like like I'm pretty sure the people who loved four already played three and loved three. Three's gameplay and just love yes. four's gameplay even more, but for people who are just introduced to four, that's like a really big turnoff for a lot of people. Yeah, it doesn't really it doesn't tell you what to expect. Like four works if you're coming from three because you're like okay, 
So where's the crazy shit? It's somewhere in here. <laughs> yep. Yeah, and that's good for, for those longtime players where they know it's coming, they trust that it's coming, and they're going to enjoy the ride until it comes. Mm-hmm. See, I think Twilight Princess bears mentioning here as an example of a game with a really long intro like the Persona Very games true. that doesn't do such a good job of it. Like, when I played Twilight Princess for the first time, I loved the intro because the whole time I was tense. I was I was getting hyped because I was like, okay, when the game gets good, it's going to get really, really good because this is a Zelda game. And it was a slow... It was like um, the good, the bad, and the ugly. It was a slow build-up to the action. But it put... Um, on on later occasions, that intro put me off playing the game again because it wasn't that interesting on its own and I didn't want to have to sit through it again. I think the Persona games especially, they do a, a really good job of having a long intro because there's stuff to keep you interested the whole time. Like, it's not hard to get through the intro and that's, to me, the mark of a very good long introduction if it's easy to stay interested because... Like, in, in Persona 3, there's things like the coffins, and then there's the guys watching you sleep, and there's just constant mysteries that you want answers to. That's great. And in Twilight Princess, you run around and you get a baby back from a monkey, and then there's, a like, a shield or something, <laughs> and it's dull. It's fucking dull. That game should have been better. That game should have been better. That's how I feel. And also... It was on the Nintendo Wii, so it's automatically like a seven. <laughs> uh, now, yeah. Uh, Good com- thing there's a remake, right? Yeah. That's true. That's true. Uh, now compare that to uh, Link to the Past, where you know you get told by Zelda telepathically to come save her. You're storming a castle within the first five minutes, and then you get instructions. Your like uncle a- dies. Yep, your mm-hmm. uncle dies. Your uncle immediately dies. Yeah, and then you're supposed to go see this sage at some temple, you know, just down into the right. And you could technically, you could go there in five minutes and see the guy and start the dungeon, but you can still go to Kakariko Village, you can still explore most of the overworld. There's a lot of stuff that you are allowed to do, but you don't necessarily have to do. But if you want to just plow through the introduction, then you can just go do that. Oh, man. The, the uncle thing is real awesome. Yeah. All right, Link, I'm gonna go. I'm gonna out, go out and do something, and then five minutes later, oops, I'm dead. And there's not even an enemy in that room. I don't think. <laughs> <laughs> like he just fell down the well, broke his ankle, and it's like, okay, I'm dead. <laughs> <laughs> Does anyone even remember his name? Because I, I think he had a name at some point, and it was just forgotten by time. I've, Ironically, I've played that game like a dozen times, and I don't think they ever say his name in game, but it might have been in the manual, like back in the day. Uh, yeah, Ribbit, or he's just Link's dad, yeah. uncle, whatever. Or hey, let's yeah, let's think about a Zelda one for a second. Like Final Fantasy one and Zelda one, they both just drop you into the world. Like there you go, have fun. And in Final Fantasy one, you could not walk up; you could just stay in the overworld and die. And with Zelda, and with Zelda one, if you're dumb enough to not go into the first cave on the first screen and get the sword, well, you're screwed. <laughs> it's dangerous to go alone. <laughs> Cause do it anyway. Swords are people; they have rights. <laughs> oh man, do they have do they have a Zelda game where you have a talking sword? Because I remember they have talking hats, talking boats, talking. Uh, annoying uh, balls of light, but I don't know about talking swords. Wasn't there a talking sword in Wind Waker? Um, or talking weapon? is kind of a talking sword. I don't... I don't think she... I don't know. I haven't actually played Skyward Sword and I don't want to because I've heard it is dreadful, but, like, that yeah. that's her, like, gimmick. Yeah. Uh, she's, like, a, she's a spirit or something, and she always reminds you if your batteries are running low. Well. Computer spirit. Yeah. As In a 20% chance, Sky with Swords fucking bollocks. <laughs> Post apocalyptic techno future fantasy RPG. Oh, yeah. uh, man. Yeah. You, know what, you know what Zelda game did post apocalyptic better? Wind Waker. And, and Ocarina of Time, honestly. 
Yeah, I thought we were going to say Ocarina. <laughs> Ocarina. Oh well, because I didn't. I don't Zombies. have any experience with Ocarina of Time, so yeah. Uh, Ocarina is like everywhere. the only game I can think of where you play the world in its pre-apocalyptic, like idyllic state, and you see everything, and it's all nice, and then you experience the apocalypse, and then the rest of the game takes place in the post-apocalypse. Like, I'm sure there are other games, but like that's the only one I can think of, and you actually get kind of used to the world being like this nice fairy tale place. So when it actually gets fucked up, it's like really. You really kind of feel it. I, that game was so... I honestly think Ocarina of Time was like ahead of its time. That game was great. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that that would be a great intro to a game, actually. Like, you play the you play the pre, pre, like, apocalypse thing for a while, and then the rest of the game is just post-apocalypse, and like, oh. I, I agree that Zelda was ahead of its time. It really makes you feel it because you go to all these places. You go to Zora's Domain. You go to Death Mountain. And you see the Gorons and the Zoras and they're happy and things are fine. And then uh, seven years later, not so much. Nope. On that nice, beautiful castle that you had to sneak through to find Princess Zelda. And now it's uh, surrounded by lava. <laughs> and Lon Lon Ranch is still there for some reason. That's because you don't raise Lon Lon Ranch. You capture Lon Lon Ranch. <laughs> yes, because again, only provider of milk in the entire world. How, how did Ganondorf n- not take it over? Because fuck you, that's why. Ganondorf likes his goddamn milk. Shut up. <laughs> yeah. uh, oh, oh, man. I remember what I was going to bring up. So, I think that, that modern RPGs suffer from a lack of manual. There was no more thrilling feeling than as a kid, you know, buying a game, and then you couldn't play it in the car, because mom said so, but you got to read the manual. And the Final Fantasy Legends series, to me, is the gold standard for manuals, because these are Game Boy games. And they came with 50-plus page manuals, they had guides on how to do everything, they had weapon and magic bestiary, so you knew what everything did before you even started playing. So you're you're like, man, I can't wait to find the Defender Sword or the Excalibur or to craft this magic spell and cast it. And the other part is, uh, you know, the character bios in the manual. So you're reading about the characters and you build this intrigue for yourself before you even start. But the games were also built in a way that you didn't need to read it. And you could still get what you needed, which was the, the 10 to 15 lines. And I'll go through this really quickly here. <clears throat> so here's the introduction to Final Fantasy Legend 3. The Pure Land Water Entity appeared and flooded this world's present, past, and future. The water brought monsters, which hunted people day and night. Cities fell one by one, covered by the sea. However, a few individuals prepare for a journey that may determine the fate of the world. Behold, the sealed city Darm. Here, three young people sent back as children from the ruins of the future are living with the Elder. He has reared them together with his own granddaughter. Got all that? Good. Game start. Have fun. Good luck. Uh, Like, you get everything you need, even if you didn't read the manual. Hmm. Okay. Uh, Cody, I'm I'm just going to say this a little bit. I'm pretty sure a 500-page manual is an exception, not the rule for <laughs> Game Boy games. 50, yeah, no. it they, uh, they are far and away the most expansive manuals in in the history of Game Boy games, I think. Yeah, but like, like gold standard is like, I don't think most, most, most games can actually manage 50 pages. <laughs> oh, boy. If they're good games. Yeah. So yeah, 50 page manuals, I don't think that's a gold standard because most games can't manage that. <laughs> oh man, I remember I remember a Game Boy game, I think Adam's Family or something, which is a nice game and it also had a guide, but I don't think it got past 20 pages of manual. Mm. Uh, yeah, I, I agree that most Game Boy games didn't do it, but you look at, at modern games these days and I think a lot of introductions are screwed because... You know, they want to introduce you to this lore, and if there's no manual to put it in, then where do they put it? They have to put it organically into the game, but most of what they put in the manual is introductory stuff that you don't need but would be fun to know. And so either now Uh, you extend the introduction, or you try and put it somewhere where it might fit, or you just cut it out and make your characters feel more shallow. Oh, I see. I see this. I see the problem now. Okay, okay. 
I do know a game with this sort of problem. Um, I believe Destiny had this very same problem. Where they had a lot of lore, a lot of stuff they wanted to tell, and a lot of storytelling bits. But it's all been regulated to, please check the official site or something. And it's like, what? So you have to go, you have to stop playing the game, go look it up on your computer or whatever to figure out the lore stuff. And you know how bad this is? It's so bad that, like, even the the in-game cutscenes refer you to, please check the lore on the site over here. Like, what the heck are you doing, guys? Jesus Christ. Yeah, because with Final Fantasy Legend 3, okay, if you read the manual, you find out all about the backstory and the pure land and how, basically, um, the whole conflict started because there was a bunch of immortals <coughs> who kept creating stronger and stronger spells to try and kill each other. Like, no, there's no way you're that immortal, you know? And if you give three shits, it's there in the manual. But they don't, they don't, you know, they don't put that in front of your face in-game because it would slow down the game. And the way, yeah. the, the way it sounds like Destiny did it, they, it sounds like a comic book where you should buy issue 96, except issue 96 is not, like, a story. It's just stuff they couldn't fit organically into the game. They don't even get to make like, any money off of it. <laughs> I mean, good like... Good friends having some good fun. <laughs> I'm sorry, please continue. <laughs> I'm glad you're talking so kindly to your mom, dude. Anyway, like... Destiny is, uh, it, it was a train wreck. The latest expansion or whatever they had does it a little better, but the the first version is like, oh my god, the story bits are like all over the place. It's like, and you can't, and even when you go to the, the site to look up all the codex and lore and whatever, it's not all arranged in a neat whatever for you to find. You have to like, you have to like actually play, I don't know, Dewey Decimal System or whatever to figure out what the heck you're trying to look for. <laughs> oh my goodness. Oh, that sounds horrible. It sounds more like you're you're playing homework than you're playing a game. Because <laughs> I instead of it, instead of the player going, wait, what are they talking about? You're going, what are they talking about? And, and it turns the hunt for information into Instead of being something interesting and fun and something you want to do, it turns it into required work. I mean, like, yeah, I know Destiny is a shooty bang bang game, but come on. At least a little lore in the game couldn't hurt it, right? Yeah. I mean, do you, do you really have to have a different, like, website or whatever to look it up and stuff? No. Look at Warframe. I mean, like, Warframe I mean, has like, a built in geez. huge codex and nobody reads it, but it's there. I mean, like, yeah, it's not even built in. That's the issue. <laughs> it's not even like, oh, here's a here's a dictionary thing that's in in the game. No, no, you have to go, you have to go online and look for the site yourself, and then like, uh it's like the stupidest thing. <laughs> Bad design choices. But, uh. Yeah, I I think that in that respect, Call of Duty got uh, lore right because. Most of the lore, from what I can tell, and what of the three games I've played since Modern Warfare, the plot is kept short, it's kept important, and it's kept relevant. And there's some Russian dude you have to shoot at the end of one of the games, and that comes up as a plot point later. Like, that guy you shot, he's not dead. <laughs> and and that's enough. That's enough to keep the player interested. And if they want to know more, I'm sure there's a wiki or something with other important hints that they missed while breezing through the levels. Yep. Oh, boy. Yeah. So, uh, I, I know I brought this up yesterday in the in the chat, but I think that Daikatana for Game Boy Color also ranks down there as one of the worst uh, introductions to a video game. Uh, oh, man, yeah, you showed that video to me. It's like, like for the Game Boy Color, right? That, yeah. Like, it's funny how that's the best iteration of Daikatana too <laughs> but like if if you if like you don't know this video you might you might as well link it or something if you don't know this video it's weird because like like the introduction is like okay the first part is you're training your guys and then someone comes over drops story stuff to you 
and then like after the story stuff you do the tutorial bit but like after doing one tutorial bit here's another chunk of dialogue and then like and then like one more tutorial bit oh here's how you jump so you jump across here's another lore bit that takes uh, how long and it's like uh it's bad because the tutorial cuts into the lore and the lore is cutting into the tutorial <laughs> it's like it's like that that's like i i know you don't have a lot of space for a game boy color game but that's not very good yeah imagine audience if you will portal okay so portal you walk into a room glados says something witty you beat the level as you're walking out glados says something witty that's daikatana except each level is about 20 seconds of combat so you walk into a room someone says something you kill some dudes you solve a puzzle or whatever and then more talking you enter the next room and there's more talking again you're you're getting two sections of talking for every section of action no 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 it's actually worse than that you know why because Okay, imagine GLaDOS is talking, but it stops you from doing anything. <laughs> <laughs> Alright? Her talking makes you stop doing whatever you're doing. And then, after she's done, you get to do your thing. And then after you do your thing, you're stopped again. And then she talks. And then you have to wait for her to stop talking again before you can go. <laughs> I mean, like, it's like, that's, that's how bad it is. That's my description of it. <laughs> Yes. Like at least Portal did it well. Like like she's talking in whatever, and then like if you do it fast enough, she's like, oh well, okay. Like she just lets you go, right? Yeah. Like, it's a Daikatana game. It stops you, and that's that's the that's the bad part. Now, to its credit, we can't blame Daikatana on Game Boy Color for not having voice acting. We have to blame the Game Boy Color itself. We can blame yeah. it for bad writing. <laughs> hey, yeah. The bad writing, yeah. yeah. I wonder if you really tried how much voice acting you could fit on a Game Boy Color. No Bionic Commando had a couple lines, Crystallis had a couple lines, but... Do you mean, like, spoken word, or can we go... No, spoken word, like, Bionic Commando! Of course, you know what, about 8 <laughs> kilobytes a second, or, you know, very <laughs> stupidly low bit rate, but... Through, through those terrible speakers. Yes. Oh, man. It's going to be like, I don't know, it's either going to be so bad it's good or just really, really bad. Yeah. Because when, when, I, when I think about it, it just reminds me of like Metal Slug. Rocket Launcher! <laughs> <laughs> I can only imagine that as being something on the Game Boy like, Rocket Launcher! <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Mm -hmm. Can you imagine it? Like, like they're, they're talking, beep, 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 beep. <laughs> Just any time they happen to trip over one of the words on the database, like whenever, whenever they trip on, whenever they say Daikatana, it comes out like Daikatana. <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't matter who's saying it. That old lady on the street, she yells it the same <laughs> as the old dude. You know what? We didn't have a whole lot of space on this cartridge. Just everyone says it the same. Oh, young man, you must find the Daikatana. <laughs> oh man <laughs> or like is it gonna be even worse like they don't have the space for the bips so everyone just says Daikatana all the time that's when you that's when you go with uh, the Undertale and you have like the little beeps and boops for the talking except for the word Daikatana <laughs> Daikatana <laughs> Hey, for some characters, that works really well. Like, you could do Beaker all day with that dialogue system. <laughs> oh. <laughs> oh, boy. Oh, man. All right. What a great podcast. Indeed. Much better than expected. Mm -hmm. I, I think we're good here. Are you guys good? Is that the whole thing? Yeah. Yeah, we did all right. <laughs> all right. Thank you all for listening to the RPG MGP. Uh, this is Cody A.K. Marpix uh, signing off. To preserve the quality of the podcast, uh, we're going to start doing an every other week schedule since a lot of us are going to be starting real life jobs soon, etc., etc., etc. But uh, we hope to keep giving you the kind of content you are expecting just on a now a bi weekly basis. So thank you all Yay. for listening.
Just Blue Sky Robin signing off. Oh, uh, there's Virgo. Going away. I'm Sam, and I'm gonna leave. Good night, everybody.